Hello. This will be a reading of Emanuel Swedenborg's Conjugial Love. And I'm doing this as a service to Swedenborg. Conjugial Love. Preliminaries. Concerning the joys of heaven and concerning weddings there. I foresee that many who read the things which follow and the memorable relations at the end of the chapters will think that they are inventions of the imagination, but I asseverate in truth that they are not inventions but are things actually done and seen, nor were they seen in any state of a mind asleep but in a state of full wakefulness. For it has pleased the Lord to manifest himself to me and to send me to teach the things which shall be of the new church, meant by the new Jerusalem in the Apocalypse. To this end he has opened the interiors of my mind and spirit, whereby it has been granted me to be in the spiritual world with angels and at the same time in the natural world with men, and this now for twenty-five years. I once saw an angel flying beneath the eastern heaven, holding in his hand and at, the, at his lips a trumpet which he sounded towards the north, towards the west, and toward the south. He was clad in a robe, which streamed behind him as he flew, and was girt about with a sash, flaming and sparkling as though with rubies and sapphires. He flew down and alighted gently upon the earth, near where I was standing. As he touched the ground he stood upon his feet and walked to and fro, then seeing me, he directed his steps towards me. I was in the spirit, and in the, and in the spirit was standing upon a hill in the southern quarter. When he was close by, I spoke to him and asked, What is going on? I heard the sound of your trumpet and saw you coming down through the air. The angel answered, I am sent to call together with the kingdoms of the Christian world, men dwelling in that region who are renowned for learning, penetrating, ingenious, and eminent in reputation for wisdom, that they may assemble on this hill where you are now standing, and from their heart may express their minds as to what have been their thought, understanding, and wisdom in the world, respecting heavenly joy and eternal happiness. The reason of my mission was this. Certain newcomers from the world, who were admitted into our heavenly society, which is in the East, have told us that not a single person in the whole Christian world knows what heavenly joy and eternal happiness are, or consequently what heaven is. Greatly wondering at this, my brethren and companions said to me, Go down, call together, and assemble the wisest men in the world of spirits, in which all mortals are first gathered after their departure from the natural world that from the mouth of many we may ascertain whether it is true that among Christians there is such great darkness and dense ignorance concerning the future life. Then he added, Wait a little, and you will see companies of the wise flocking hither. The Lord will prepare for them a hall of assembly. I waited, and lo, after half an hour I saw two companies from the north, two from the east, and two from the south. As they came, they were introduced by the angel of the trumpet into the hall which had been prepared for them, and there took the places assigned them according to the quarters. There were six companies or groups. A seventh at the east was not seen by the others on account of the light. When they were assembled, the angel disclosed to them the reason why they had been summoned, and asked that the companies, each in turn, would set forth their wisdom respecting heavenly joy and eternal happiness. After this, each company gathered in a circle, face to face, that they might recall this matter from among the ideas they had entertained in the former world, and then examine it, and after examination and consultation, present their conclusion. After consultation, the first company, which was from the north, said, Heavenly joy and eternal happiness are one with the very life of heaven. Therefore, every one who enters heaven enters as to life into its festivities, just as one who goes to a wedding enters into its festivities. Is not heaven above us? 
before our eyes, and thus in a place. And there and nowhere else is happiness upon happiness, and pleasure upon pleasure. When man enters heaven, then from the fullness of the joys of that place, he is admitted into these as to every perception of his mind, and every sensation of his body. Heavenly happiness, therefore, which is also eternal happiness, is nothing else than admission into heaven, and admission by divine grace. After this speech, the second company from the north, from their wisdom, expressed the following opinion. Heavenly joy and eternal happiness are nothing else than cheerful companionship with angels, and sweet conversation with them, whereby from pleasant and witty discourse the countenance is kept continually expanded with gladness, and the faces of the whole company are wreathed in happy smiles. What are heavenly joys but the variations of such things to eternity? The third company, which was the fourth of the wise from the western quarter, speaking from the thoughts of their affections, declared, what else is heavenly joy and eternal happiness but feastings with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, upon whose tables will be rich and delicate foods, with generous and noble wines, and after the feast, sports and the dances of maidens and young men, tripping to the measures of tabors and flutes, with the sweet singing of odes interspersed, and then at evening dramatic representations, and after these again feastings, and so on every day to eternity. After this utterance, the fourth company, which was the second from the western quarter, announced their opinion, saying, We have entertained many ideas respecting heavenly joy and eternal happiness, and after exploring various joys and comparing them with each other, have come to the conclusion that heavenly joys are paradisal joys. What else is heaven but a paradise, stretching from east to west and from south to north? paradise wherein a few a fruit trees and delightful flowers, and in the centre the magnificent tree of life, around which the blessed will sit, eating fruits of delicate flavour, and adorned with wreaths of the most fragrant flowers, and since by bre reason of the breathing of perpetual spring, these fruits and flowers are born and reborn daily, and with infinite variety, and since by their perpetual birds and birth and blossom, and by the constant vernal temperature, the mind is continually renewed. The blessed must needs attract and breathe out new joys from day to day, and thus be restored to the flower of their age, and thereby to the primitive state into which Adam and his wife were created and so be led back into their paradise which has been transferred from earth to heaven. The fifth company, which was the first of the men of genius from the southern quarter, said, Heavenly joy and eternal happiness are nothing else than supereminent dominion, with boundless wealth, and from the superregal magnificence and super illustrious splendour that these are the joys of heaven, and the continual enjoyment thereof, which is eternal happiness. This we have perceived clearly from the case of those who enjoyed them in the former world, and also from the statement that the happy in heaven will reign with the Lord. And being the sons of him who is king of kings, and lord of lords, will be kings and princes, and will sit upon thrones, with angels ministering to them. We have perceived clearly the magnificence of heaven from the statement that the new Jerusalem, by which is portrayed the glory of heaven, will have gates, each of which will be a single pearl, streets of pure gold, and a wall with foundations of precious stones. Therefore every one who is received into heaven has his own palace, resplendent with gold and precious things, and a dominion which will pass in turn from one to another. And knowing in such things joys are innate, and happiness implanted, and that they are God's promises, which cannot be broken, we are unable to deduce the happy state of heavenly life from any other source. After this, the sixth company, which was the second from the southern quarter, lifted up its voice and said, The joy of heaven and its eternal happiness are nothing else than the perpetual glorification of God, a solemn festival continuing to eternity, and most blessed worship with songs and jubilees, and thus a constant uplifting of the heart to God. 
with full trust in the acceptance of their prayers and praises because of the divine munificence and in their own blessedness. Some of the company added that it would be a glorification attended with magnificent illuminations and the most fragrant incense, a glorification with stately processions headed by a pontiff with a great trumpet, who would be followed by primates and key bearers, great and small, and after these, men with palms and women with golden images in their hands. The seventh company, not single to the others on account of the light, was from the east of heaven. They were angels from the same society whence came the angel of the trumpet. When they heard in the heaven that not a single person in the Christian world knows what the joy of heaven and eternal happiness are, these angels said to one another, said one to another, This can never be the truth. There cannot be such great darkness and such mental stupor among Christians. Let us go down and ourselves hear whether it be the truth. If it is the truth, it is surely a monstrous thing. Those angels then said to the angel of the trumpet, You know that after death all men who had desired heaven and had some definite thought about the joys there are introduced into the joys of their imagination and that when they have learned by experience the nature of these joys, they are, that they are accordant with the vain ideas of their own mind and the ravings of their own fantasy, they are led away from them and instructed. This is done with many spirits in the world of spirits, being spirits who in the former life have meditated upon heaven and have formed so definite a conclusion respecting the joys there that they desire them. Having thus, the angel of the trumpet said to the six companies, which had been called together from the wise of the Christian world, Follow me, and I will introduce you to, into your joys, and thus into your heaven. Saying this, the angel took the lead, and was accompanied first by the company of those who had persuaded themselves that heavenly joys consisted solely in cheerful companionship and sweet conversation. These he introduced to assemblies in the northern quarter, consisting of those to whom, in the former world, they were the only joys of heaven. In that quarter was a spacious house in which such persons were gathered together, and in the house were more than fifty rooms, distinguished according to the various kinds of conversation. In some of these rooms they were talking about things they had seen and heard in the marketplace and the streets. In some they were telling pleasant stories concerning the fair sex, interspersed with felicious, facetious remarks, and these were so multiplied that the countenances of all in the company expanded with hilarious laughter. In other rooms they talked about the news of courts, of ministries, of the body politic, and of various matters which had emanated from secret committees, together with arguments and conjectures respecting future events. In others they talked of business, in others on literary subjects, in others of such things as pertain to civic prudence and moral life, in others about ecclesiastical affairs and the sex, sects, and so on. It was granted me to look into this house, and I saw men running about from room to room, seeking out companies in harmony with their affections, and so with their joy. In these companies I observed men of three kinds, some as though panting to speak, some longing to ask questions, and others eager to listen. The house had four doors, one towards each quarter, and I noticed that many left their companies and were hastening to get out. Some of these I followed to the eastern door, and saw several sitting near it with a sad countenance. Going up to them, I asked them the cause of their sadness. They answered, The doors of this house are kept closed against those who would go out. It is now the third day since we entered, and we have exhausted the life of our desire in companies and conversations, and are so utterly wearied with continual chattering that we can scarcely bear to hear the murmur of the sound thereof. Therefore, in weariness, we betook ourselves to the store and knocked, but we are answered. The doors of this house are not opened for those who would go out, but only for those who would come in remain and enjoy the joys of heaven. From this answer we conclude that we must remain here to eternity, and therefore sadness has invaded our minds, and now our breast begins to be oppressed, and anxiety overtakes us. 
The angel then spoke to them and said, This state is the death of the joys which you believe to be alone heavenly, when yet they are nothing but accessories of heavenly joys. They then asked the angel, What then is heavenly joy? And the angel replied briefly, It is the delight of doing something which is of use to oneself and to others, and the delight of use derives its essence from love and its existence from wisdom. The delight of use springing from love by means of wisdom is the soul and life of all heavenly joys. In the heavens there are most cheerful companionships which exhilarate the minds of the angels, are pleasing to their army, delight their breasts and recreate their bodies. But they enjoy these delights after they have performed the uses of their employments and occupations. From these uses comes the soul and life and all their joys and pleasures, and if you take away this soul or life, the accessory joys successively become joyless, becoming first indifferent, then like trifles, and finally sad and distressing. When these words had been spoken, the door was opened, and those sitting by it sprang out and fled to their homes, each to his own employment and his own work, and they received new life. After this, the angel addressed those who had deluded themselves with the idea that the joys of heaven and eternal happiness consisted in feasting with Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, followed by sports and public shows, and then by more feasting, and so on to eternity. To these he said, Follow me, and I will bring you into the felicities of your joys. He then led them through a grove to a level place covered with boards, on which were set tables, fifteen on one side and fifteen on the other, and they asked, Why so many tables? The angel answered, The first table is Abraham's, the second Isaac's, the third Jacob's, and next to these in order come the tables of the twelve apostles. On the other side is the same number of tables for their wives, and first three belong the first three belong those of Sarah and the wife of Abraham, Rebekah the wife of Isaac, and Leah and Rachel, the wives of Jacob. The twelve others are for the wives of the twelve apostles. After some delay, all the tables were seen to be laden with dishes of food, the little spaces between them being embellished with small pyramids containing sweet meats. The guests stood around the tables, awaiting their respective hosts. These were shortly seen to enter, in order of precedence, from Abraham to the last of the apostles, and presently each approached his own table and reclined upon a couch, a couch at its head. They then said to those who stood around, Recline ye also with us. And they did so, the men with the patriarchs and the women with their wives, and they ate and drank in gladness and with veneration. After the feast and patriarchs retired, and then began sports, dances of maidens and young men, and after these, public shows. When these were ended, they were again invited to the feast, but with the condition that they were to eat on the first day with Abraham, on the second with Isaac, on the third with Jacob, on the fourth with Peter, on the fifth with James, on the sixth with John, on the seventh with Paul, and with the rest in order till the fifteenth day, when the festivities would be renewed in the same order, changing seats, and so on, to eternity. After this, the angel, calling together the men of his company, said to them, All those whom you saw at the tables had been in like imaginary thought with yourselves concerning the joys of heaven and eternal happiness therefrom, and such mock festivities have been provided and permitted by the Lord to the end, that they may, may, be, that they may see the vanity of their ideas and be led out of them. Those men whom you saw at the heads of the tables were impersonated, being old men, many of them bearded, men of the peasant class, who, because of some wealth, were prouder than others, and on whom was induced the fantasy that they were the ancient patriarchs, but follow me into the ways leading out of the school of sports. Following them, they then saw some fifty here and fifty there, who had filled their bellies with food, even to nausea, and were longing to return to their home affairs, some to their offices, some to their shops, and some to their trades. But many were detained by the keepers of the grove, and were asked about 
the days of feasting, and whether they had yet eaten at table with Peter and with Paul, and whether they were going away before they had done so, which would be unbecoming, and so would be their shame. But most of them answered, We are sated with our joys. Food has, been, has become insipid to us, and its flavor dry. Our stomachs loathe it. We cannot bear to taste it. We have dragged out some days and nights in this luxury, and beg earnestly to be allowed to go. Then, being released, they fled to their homes with panting breath and rapid pace. The angel then called the men of his company together, and on the way gave them the following instruction concerning heaven. In heaven, as in the world, there are foods and drinks, there are feasts and banquets, and with the leading men there are tables spread with sumptuous delicacies and choice and delicious foods, wherein the animus is exhilarated and recreated. There are also sports, public shows, and entertainments of music and song, and all these in the highest perfection. Such things are joys to them also, but they are not happiness. The latter must be within the joys, and then from the joys. Happiness within joys makes joys to be joys, enriching them and keeping them from becoming cheap and loathsome. And this happiness every one has from the performance of use and his own function. Within the affection of every angel's will is a latent pain which draws the mind on to the doing of something. By this the mind renders itself tranquil, tranquil and satisfied. The satisfaction and tranquillity induce a state of mind receptive of the love of use from the Lord, and from the reception of this comes that heavenly happiness which is the life of the joys previously mentioned. In this essence, heavenly food is nothing else but love, wisdom, and use together, that is, use from love by means of wisdom. Therefore, in heaven, food for the body is given to everyone according to the use which he performs, sumptuous to those who are in eminent use, moderate but of exquisite flavor to those in a use of medium degree, common to those in a common use, but none at all to the slothful. After this he summoned the company of the wise, so called, who had who made heavenly joys and eternal happiness therefrom, to consist in supereminent dominion and boundless wealth, and in superregal magnificence and super illustrious splendor, and this because it is said in the word that they shall be kings and princes, that they shall reign with Christ forever, and that they shall be ministered to by angels, besides much else. To these men the angel said, Follow me, and I will introduce you into your joys. Then he introduced them into a portico constructed with columns and pyramids. Fronting it was a low palace, through which the way opened into a portico. It was through this palace that he introduced them. And lo, men were seen, twenty here and twenty there, all waiting in expectation. Then suddenly one who personated an angel was present, and said to them, through this portico lies the way to heaven. Wait a little and prepare yourselves, for the elder among you are to be kings, and the younger princes. When this had been said, then besides each column appeared a throne, and upon the throne a silken robe, and upon the robe a scepter and a crown. And beside each pyramid appeared a chair of state, raised three cubits from the ground, and on each chair a chain with golden links, and a ribbon of an order of knighthood, joined at the ends with class of diamonds. Then a voice cried out, Come now, robe yourselves, take your seats, and wait. Instantly the older men ran to the thrones, and the younger to the chairs of state, and putting on their robes sat down. There was then seen a kind of mist rising up from the lower regions, and from the inhaling this mist the faces of those sitting on the thrones and chairs began to be puffed up, and their chests to be swollen, and themselves filled with confidence that now they were kings and princes. This mist was an aura of the fantasy with which they were inspired. Suddenly young men flew to them, as if from heaven, and stood two behind each throne, and one behind each chair ready to wait on them, and then from time to time proclamation was made by a herald, Ye kings and princes, wait ye a little while, your palaces in heaven are now being prepared. Courtiers from the re retinue will presently come and introduce you. They waited and waited until their spirits panted for breath, and they were utterly wearied with desire. 
After three hours, heaven was opened above their heads, and angels looked down, and having compassion on them, said, Why sit ye thus foolish, and play the part of actors? They have been playing tricks with you, and have changed you from men to idols, because you have set your hearts upon the idea that you are to reign with Christ as kings and princes, and are to be ministered to by angels. Have you forgotten the Lord's words, that he who wishes to be great in heaven becomes a servant? Learn then what is meant by kings and princes, and what by reigning with Christ. It is to be wise and perform uses, the kingdom of Christ, which is heaven, being a kingdom of uses. For the Lord loves all men, and from love wills good to all, and good is use. And because the Lord does goods or uses mediately through angels, and in the world through men, Therefore, to those who perform uses faithfully, he gives the love of use, and the reward thereof, which is eternal blessedness, and this is eternal happiness. In the heavens, as on earth, there is preeminent dominion and boundless wealth, for there are governments there, and forms of governments, and therefore greater and lesser powers and dignities. And those who are in the highest dignity have palaces and courts excelling in magnificence and splendor, and palaces and courts of emperors and kings on earth. And from the number of their courtiers, ministers, and attendants, and the splendor of their apparel, honor and glory surround them. But the highest among them are chosen from those whose heart is in the public welfare, it being, to the bodily senses alone, that they are in the fullness of magnificence, and this for the sake of obedience. And since it is for the public welfare that every one in a society, as in one common body, shall be of some use, and since every use is from the Lord, and is done through angels and men as if by them, it is evident that this is what is meant by reigning with the Lord. On hearing these words from heaven, the impersonated kings and princes came down from their thrones and chairs of state, and threw away their scepters, crowns, and robes. The mist wherein the aura of fantasy then departed from them, and a bright cloud wherein was an aura of wisdom, veiled them about, and from this aura sanity returned to their minds. Look for my next video, wherein the joys of heaven chapter will be continued.